what happens if tightness x is higher? Look at a given household. You now consider a situation with a higher tightness. What can we what can we expect? Um, and we can see that what we need to figure out is what happened to this sigma uh, to this sigma x. Uh, so that's going to be key here because we can see that sigma x shows up um, shows up everywhere. So something we know is that if the tightness x is higher, something that we know is that of course income, which is f of x k high, is going to be higher. So if you have a tighter market, we know that a tighter market is always good to be a seller. So Household I, if you have a higher tightness, uh, you'll have a higher income. Okay. Um, but, so that's kind of obvious uh, and that's natural in any matching model. But now what I want the question is how does this income and initial wealth is going to be allocated between uh, you know, purchases of services and savings? How does this consumption saving decision is affected by a change in tightness? Uh, so, and, and you know, why should it be? Well, because when the tightness changes, we know that um, the matching wage is going to change tau x. So because when tightness changes, it becomes, say if tightness goes up, it becomes harder to buy services. You know, your visit tend to be less successful. So the matching wage is going to go up. Households have to devote more resources to buying things, um, to matching with um, sellers, with service providers. And so as a result, you know, buying services becomes relatively less attractive. So we expect that households are going to adjust their behavior once tightness goes up. Um, but to figure out, so we have to figure out uh, what happens to uh, sigma x. Once we know that, then we know how the household behavior changes. Um, so remember that sigma x, so we have the expression here for sigma x. And so, uh, what do we know? So we know that tau x, that's uh, increasing in x. When the market is tighter, the uh, matching wedge becomes bigger. Uh, so that's something that we have uh, established before. Okay, so from this, we know that one plus tau x to the power of one minus epsilon is going to be decreasing in x. And the reason is that epsilon is strictly bigger than one. So now this one plus tau x is increasing in x, but you put it to the power of something that's negative, you get a decreasing function. Okay, now something that's key is that the function which um, takes some argument y to produce y over uh, one plus y, uh, this function is increasing in y. How do we know that? Well, um, you know, this is just um, a rational function. Uh, and we know that this function, it's uh, very easy to figure out uh, their behavior. What you can do is just, you just need to figure out their asymptotes as well as, uh, you know, their vertical and horizontal asymptotes. And then you can figure out exactly um, their behavior. So if I put, uh, well, I guess, uh, so I put y here on the horizontal axis and then on the vertical axis I'm going to plot uh, I'm going to plot the function y over uh, 1 plus y okay so I need to put uh, my asymptote so here we know that this function is going to asymptote to infinity around minus 1 so we can put that here This is zero, and we also know that that function has some dots to one, both when y goes to plus infinity and when y goes to minus infinity. So we can put one here. Okay, and um, furthermore, we also know that that function y over one plus y is going to be zero uh, when y is equal to zero. So here. Okay, and so then it's uh, very easy to plot the function. So you know the function is going to go like this. Um, then here it is some dots, it's going to go to plus infinity. So you can see this function is always increasing. Uh, you know, I mean, um, here it's uh, pretty trivial, but this type of analysis using just some dots 
as well as the roots of the function. It's very helpful for any rational functions. And you can always figure out whether they're increasing or decreasing. So here it's particularly, particularly simple. Um, so at the end of the day, what we see is that uh, sigma x is a composition of a function that's increasing. And then, so uh, one minus epsilon that's decreasing, so you get something decreasing. And then you put this um, one plus tau x, one minus epsilon, you put it through a function uh, that's increasing, and so when you do the composition of a decreasing function and an increasing function, you get a decreasing function. Uh, so at the end of the day, what we know is that um, uh, sigma x is going to be decreasing. Decreasing in x, um, and you know, uh, um, x, so the, the domain of x has to be uh, the domain of uh, tau x. Um, and the domain of tau x we know is uh, tightness between 0 and xm. xm is um, the value of x where tau uh, becomes infinite. So sigma x is going to be decreasing in x. Uh, and in fact, we know that when uh, decreasing in x, sigma 0, we know is just going to be something positive. Um, because tau of 0 is a positive number. Uh, so tau of 0 is a positive number, and so sigma of 0 is a positive number. And now at xm, we know that tau of xm is infinite. 1 plus tau of xm is infinite. You put, it, you put that to 1 minus epsilon, which is negative. You get something that's 0. And then we know that at 0, sigma x is therefore, uh, is therefore going to be 0. So sigma at xm is going to be equal to 0. Uh, okay, so these are the interesting results. So, um, because sigma x is decreasing in x, what we learn from that is uh, what we learn from that are several things. So it means that the share of income plus initial wealth uh, I shouldn't say devoted, I should say spent here. The share of income and initial wealth spent on uh, services is lower. So when you have a higher tightness, uh, you're going to have so that's key, you'll have a higher income. So it's a good, but the share of that income that you're going uh, to spend on services uh, is going to be lower. Okay, that's because buying becomes more complicated. So the share of income and initial wealth spent on services is lower. The share of income plus initial wealth saved or if you want, stored as real wealth is higher, so people are going to save more. Uh, so that we can tell um, for sure. Uh, then, you know, what happens to consumption is not exactly clear because um, and even what, what happened to consumption is not uh, exactly clear because um, you have a bigger income and you, you spend a smaller share of that on services. And furthermore, you have to devote a bigger share of that income to matching. And uh, so for consumption, what happens, we, we don't know exactly. So we know that the uh, matching wage is going to be larger, and therefore we can say that the share of purchases devoted to consumption is lower, and we can say that the share of purchases, so that's tau x, devoted to matching is higher. 
So the share that's uh, devoted, so that actually is tau x, the share of pure sales devoted to uh, matching, the share of pure sales devoted to consumption. Uh, you could say it's, uh, it's one minus tau x. So here we're looking at how um, consumption and saving depend on uh, slack in our model with heterogeneous agents. And so um, a key thing that we had said is that spending is going to be a fraction sigma x of our initial wealth as well as income. Sigma x, uh, or for, uh, therefore, is going to be the marginal propensity to spend. Uh, so it's a propensity to uh, spend out of both wealth and income. And the question is, how does sigma x uh, vary with uh, slack in the economy, how it varies with uh, the tightness x. Um, and so that, that's what we want to look at. And of course, because what is not spent is going to be saved as uh, real wealth holdings um, or real money holdings, um, one minus sigma x, of course, is going to be the marginal propensity to save. Um, and so if we know how sigma x move or the marginal propensity to spend move, we'll also be able to figure out, of course, how the marginal propensity to save moves. It moves in opposite direction. Um, so we want to know how these things vary with um, with the state of the economy, with the amount of slack in the economy. And so, um, and so what we found is that um, sigma x, so the key findings is that which we have here. So key findings is that um, sigma x is going to be decreasing in x um, so that's the key thing that sigma x is decreasing in x um, so that means uh, that has direct implication for how the marginal propensity to spend and the marginal propensity to save vary with um, the state of the economy. So that's what I want to flash uh, to flash out here. Um, and in fact, this is what uh, we kind of had already discussed. But so just to sum up, so what we found is that uh, marginal propensity to spend in this model which is sigma x. Uh, and so we saw sigma x is decreasing in x, so the marginal propensity to spend is lower in tight, uh, in a tight economy. And why is intuition? Well, it's because when you have an economy that's very tight, when there is very little slack, um, it's harder to buy stuff. Um, there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of potential buyers relative to the number of sellers. Um, so, you know, your visits are less likely to be successful. You have to devote a bigger uh, fraction of your spendings to just matching. And so it makes buying less attractive. So everything else equal, um, the marginal propensity to spend is going to be lower in a tighter economy. Um, because basically, when you have a very tight economy, um, uh, buying becomes buying is more complicated uh, visits are less likely to be successful and so there's uh, a larger share or spending is just devoted to matching. So all of this makes it uh, less, makes spending less appealing and therefore saving more appealing. So the marginal propensity to spend is lower in tighter economies. The converse is also true. Therefore, the marginal propensity to save is higher in tighter in a tighter economy. So that's, for instance, something that we could um, examine, say, in the aftermath um, of the pandemic. 
the economy becomes extremely tight, both because you had a huge amount of demand and because the supply was restricted uh, by the pandemic. And so here this model predicts that uh, the marginal propensity to uh, to spend should have been lower just due to the difficulty of buying stuff and the marginal propensity to sell should have been higher. Now that's a direct prediction of the model here. And so just one thing I wanted to uh, uh, also wrap up is that we also had discussed the share of purchases devoted to uh, consumption, the share of purchases devoted to matching. This is uh, given by TAUX and 1 minus TAUX. Uh, just want to highlight w w why is that the case because we said that um, consumption we know that it's one it's spending y divided by one plus tau x but you know that if tau x is uh, small which in practice it is this is approximately equal to one minus tau x times y you know because one over one plus x is always approximately uh, 1 over 1 plus x, it's always approximately equal to 1 minus x when x is close to 0, right? Um, and so, uh, right, so if we see that here, what we infer is that, uh, you know, approximately, tau x is approximately the share of spending devoted to matching. So that's a good approximation to always remember. Okay, um, and so what we know is that when the market is uh, tighter, tau x go, goes up. So basically, what we infer from this is that the share of spending that's kind of useful to remember. Um, so share of spending devote oops so, uh, devoted to matching is higher in a tighter economy. And you know the converse is also true, of course, the share of spending. Um, devoted to consumption is going to be lower uh, in a tighter economy. And that's because, you know, uh, spending is less, is harder, you know, is less appealing, translates less into consumption in tight economies that the marginal propensity to spend is going to be lower um, in a tighter economy. So this is how uh, this is how the amount of slack in the economy, the state of the of the economy, affects the marginal propensity to spend and the marginal propensity to spend. And of course, we also know that uh, the slack in the economy, of course, uh, also affects uh, income because we had said that income is going to be higher um, when uh, you have a tighter um, a tighter economy. So you can have these two countervailing forces. On the one hand, you have larger income in a tight economy, but on the other hand, you also want to spend less, a smaller fraction of that income in a tighter economy. Um, so we'd have to put these two things together when we study the aggregate demand, um, because uh, in a way you have two forces that are opposed, the amount of income that you have to spend and the shares that you want to spend, they move in opposite direction. Um, so we'll have to put that together now when we study the aggregate demand. <clears throat> 